You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Hello? (laughs) Welcome, I think. (laughs) <laughs> definitely welcome maybe no i'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm hello and welcome to another arcane carolinas i'm your co-host Charlie i am your other co-host multi award winning novelist michael g williams charlie mushaw not feeling social today <laughs> <laughs> Are you, are you recording from the other side of a just like barely cracked front door? <laughs> right. well, I, feel like, I feel like what we just talked about before you hit start on the recording definitely played into that mindset of like, <laughs> hello, do I want to do, do, do I want to open this? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, hello and welcome to Arcane Carolinas. Quick note before we get started, our 100th episode will be this fall, 2023, in the spooky season, and we would love to have you be a part of it. You can leave us a voicemail. You can talk about what your favorite legend is. You can talk about just saying hi, whatever you want. We really do want this to be a community, and we want to give people a place to share. Don't say anything you wouldn't say to your mom. And please don't use a last name unless you really, really want to for privacy. Understand we have a broad audience and, you know, kids do listen to this show. So don't go too wild. That number is 919-444-2110. Again, if you'd like to be a part of our 100th episode, we'd love to have you on. Please leave a message at 919-444-2110. And if I accidentally pick up when you're trying to leave a voicemail, (laughs) like definitely happened to some people, because, you know, if I'm not paying attention, the phone rings. Hello. They're like, oh, I was calling to leave a voicemail. Oh, cool. How how are you? We're all fine. Thank you. (laughs) You know, I'll, I'll try not to do that. But, you know, if I do, please call back and leave a message. That is a difference between us. Uh, <laughs> if my phone rings i'm mad at whoever called me <laughs> well the one okay so here's the deal the area code the number the the exchange everything was perfect for it being a work call ah uh, yeah no i get that and i was like huh i should probably pick this up hello hello i was trying to leave a voicemail oh well this is charlie and thank you and goodbye <laughs> <laughs> If I could, I would probably set my phone to automatically block any number that actually tries to voice call me ever. So that's just how I am, you know? (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Even when I've had to call you, like, it's very rare that we speak on the phone. Most of the time we chat on the internet or we talk on Zoom when we're doing these or see in person. We call you. You have answered the phone when I've called you. And I know you have my number. You've still answered it. Is everything okay? (laughs) <laughs> I just assume if anybody actually calls me on my texting device, they must be having an emergency. It's like, yeah, man, everything's fine. I'm driving. What's up? <laughs> See, it's funny because I would be the person recording from the other side of the barely cracked front door. Mm-hmm. So anyway, let's talk about a genuine hero of the United States out of Beaufort, South Carolina. Yeah, this is a Michael history deep dive, right? Yeah, it is. It's going to be really fun, though. It's such an amazing adventure story. It's so cool. And I know nothing about it. So take us on a ride. All right. I also knew nothing about it until pretty recently and was pretty shocked that I had never heard this story before. And then I realized probably why I've never heard this story before. But this story takes place in Beaufort or starts in Beaufort, South Carolina. And I want to note, I know that Beaufort, North Carolina, and Beaufort, South Carolina are spelled the same, but they are pronounced differently. Mm -hmm. I googled how to pronounce Beaufort, South Carolina, and a real estate website in Beaufort says to pronounce it like this. So if I'm wrong, I need somebody to tell me so that I can say it differently in the future. And correct that website. Yes, but a South Carolina real estate agent has told me via the internet that this is how it's said. We're going to start with, of course, the indigenous history of the region around Beaufort. The best known indigenous people in that immediate area of modern day Beaufort were called the Yamasi or the Yamasi. 
I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce their name. Couldn't find any guidance on that. Some sources refer to them as a tribe. Others refer to them as sort of a multi-nation confederation of tribes. In part, that's because they were formed out of multiple indigenous peoples who were displaced by the Spanish and other places like modern day Atlanta, which is a fun little Dragon Con tie in. You just got confirmed as a guest for Dragon Con this year, right? Yeah, I'm an attending professional. You're an attending professional. So Michael will be at Dragon Con. I'll see you there. I'll see you, the listener, there if you're a listener who will be there, which mostly is me saying, hey, Gary, I'll see you in Atlanta. Yeah, I will not be there. (laughs) It's possible that I'm going to try to get onto some podcasting track or multimedia track panels as well. We'll see. So there's been disagreement over what language family the Masi was in. Some people say it was Muscogean. There's some people who say other stuff. We're not totally sure. Again, that's partly because they were formed out of multiple displaced people. As the Spanish explored the southeastern U.S., which we've talked about a bunch of times, they would attempt to convert the peoples they encountered over to Catholicism. And some of those people converted and some of those people would simply move away. And (laughs) some fought back, like happened in Juara. The Guale people of what's now the Atlanta area were one of those people who they just withdrew from the region rather than put up with the Spanish. So they merged with the Amasi as they both sort of converged on what's now Beaufort, South Carolina. And there they formed this large multi-town nation that retained the name Yamasi or Yamasi. There's a theory that that name might mean gentle in their language, which would be really ironic because they immediately allied themselves with the English colonists in the Carolina colony, traded for English guns and started raiding the other peoples around them and the Spanish settlers in Georgia and Florida. They were wide ranging in their fight against the Spaniards. It was really funny to read about this because it started with, it's possible their name means gentle. The English were happy to trade with the Amasi, but they did so via exploitative and sort of increasingly disadvantageous and exploitative terms over time. They had these really exploitative trade agreements that left the Amasi people in debt to those English colonists. So the Yamasi formed a unified coalition of indigenous peoples and went to war against the English, forcing most English settlers at the very beginning of the 18th century elsewhere in South Carolina low country to retreat to Charleston and abandon other attempts to establish Mm -hmm. colonial outposts. The English organized an army in response and over the course of two years defeated the Yamasi and forced them south into Spanish territory in sort of like the coast of modern day Georgia and northeastern Florida, where They encountered smallpox, thanks to the Spaniards, and that more or less wiped them out. So the remainder of the Yamasi people merged with the Seminole people to survive. And that's something that's a pattern that we've talked about happening many times in many places in the southeast. So those were the native inhabitants of Beaufort, South Carolina, however. But the person that we're going to talk about for the bulk of this episode is a guy named Robert Smalls. <laughs> Wee little Robert. Well, it's funny because he was actually very tall, especially for the time. Oh, man. Just call him Shorty. Right. I always love that when somebody that is very tall is called Shorty or you call somebody a smaller statue stretch or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I like it. As long as they're okay with it. Yeah, that's the thing. If it comes from a kind place, I I knew a guy that was shorter than me that would always call me shorty. Okay, there you go. (laughs) And I I liked it. It made me laugh. (laughs) In one of the Halloween movies in the revival trilogy, there's Mm -hmm. a couple who are both named John and the taller one is Little John and the (laughs) the, the less tall one is Big John. And I really like that a lot. So Robert Smalls was born on April 5th, 1839 in Beaufort, South Carolina. His mother was an enslaved woman named Lydia Polite, and she was Gullah. We talked about the Gullah a lot mm-hmm. in the Boo Hags and Boo Daddies episode last <laughs> fall. I, I can't not laugh at Boo Daddies with the giant head. and the, It's too good. What a great legend. <laughs> Lydia taught Smalls to speak Gullah and about Gullah culture, in Mm. addition to him learning English as a child. Lydia was an enslaved woman living in a cabin behind the home of her enslaver, a plantation owner named John McKee. Robert Smalls' father was known to be a white man in that household, but it has never been determined or it was never written down or whatever, whether that was John McKee, whether that was his son, Henry, or whether it was the man that they hired to manage their plantation. But it's worth noting that the man they hired to manage their plantation was named Patrick Smalls. So Mm. there's some indication there. We Patrick. (laughs) But it's also possible that one of the McKee men fathered Robert Smalls, but they could not allow him to have their name at the time. So Robert Smalls was also born enslaved by virtue of being born to an enslaved mother. Mm -hmm. 
even though he was an enslaved boy, the McKee family showed extensive favoritism to him and like really doted on him so much so that his mother Lydia asked the family to send him to work in the fields on their plantation because she was worried that he would not realize how horrifying slavery was Mm -hmm. that he would grow up not realizing what was being done to people in the course Mm -hmm. of slavery i don't imagine that she explained that to them as her reasoning for it but that is what she told people later in her life Mm -hmm. and while working in the fields i mean at age nine he was sent to work in the fields while he was working in the fields he saw firsthand all the worst horrors of slavery and became, to put it mildly, (laughs) disinterested in taking it lying down. (laughs) He was not interested in being treated like that. By age 12, according to some of his descendants who curated a traveling exhibition about him later, Mm -hmm. by age 12, he'd done a couple of stints in jail for refusing to accept the way he and other enslaved people were treated. And in fact, he had gotten such a reputation for outspoken independence that his mother, And the McKee family took him out of the fields and sent him to Charleston to work in the city at various city jobs in hopes of keeping him safe from the people who ran things in the fields. Hmm. So McKee essentially rented him out and allowed Hmm. him to keep one dollar a week of whatever fees McKee took by doing so. And Small spent the rest of his childhood learning various trades and working a variety of jobs in Charleston. But the one that he really excelled at was piloting ships. Okay. In one account that I read, contemporaries of Robert Smalls wrote, quote, few know the sea islands and their waters better than Robert Smalls. And during this time, he met his future wife, a woman named Hannah. Hannah was enslaved by another local family and worked in a Charleston hotel. And Robert and Hannah were allowed to move into an apartment together in the city of Charleston, and they had two children, but they also knew that their respective enslavers could separate them at any time for any reason. So Robert asked the family who had enslaved Hannah if he could buy Hannah and their two children out of slavery and free them himself. Mm -hmm. And the slaveholder said yes, but the price would be $800. Do you know what that translates to today? Today, that translates into something like 35 grand. Which is a ton of money. Yeah. This was an outrageously high price at the time, too. Robert had been working in Charleston for 10 years at this point. The tiny amount the McKee had allowed him to keep from the money the McKee was paid for Robert's labor had only allowed him to save up 100 bucks. So he knew $800 was an impossible price. And then what he was being told was no in a different form. Mm Mm-hmm. And knowing that he would never come up with the rest of the money, he and Hannah worked out a plan. Smalls originally was the pilot of a ship called the Planter, like the term for a plantation owner. Okay. And and we see that a lot in like census records. If somebody owns a plantation and their profession is listed as planter. The Planter was a steamer that was used to transport goods, mostly cotton, into and out of Charleston before the war. So there's some, in, <laughs> and because the ship was named the Planter, there is some irony in the fact that there was an enslaved crew working the ship. Right. At the outset of the Civil War, the Planter got retrofitted as a vessel in the Confederate Navy, and it got rechristened as the CSS Planter. And they added a bunch of guns to it, stopped using it for shipping, and designated it to be the guard boat for other ships that were entering or leaving Confederate Charleston. And it also ran a bunch of like regular supply routes out to the Sea Islands around Charleston and to these Confederate military outposts there. The Confederacy had built just a ton of these tiny little, they're not even really forts, just like fortifications, and would station soldiers out there to watch the shipping lanes and to watch for incursions Mm -hmm. into Charleston Harbor by the U.S. Navy, which had a blockade going right outside of Charleston. The planter was getting used to take those people's supplies. Mm -hmm. Among the guns the Confederate Navy added to it were a 32-pound pivot gun, which is this like big cannon that's mounted on the deck of the ship. And it looks just like a cannon in an old-timey fort that you'd see in like an old (laughs) movie or a cartoon or something, but it can swivel. It's like on a base and you can turn it, you know, in an arc. Then there were several 24-pound howitzers, which are, again, just like a different kind of old-timey cannon, and then a whole bunch of other deck guns, including one that had been looted from Fort Sumter by the Confederacy when they took Fort Sumter at the start of the war. Smalls was still the pilot of the ship, even after the Confederate Navy requisitioned it, but enslaved crew were not allowed to hold rank on a ship. And so, technically, he was listed as the wheelman for the ship, but really... 
He was the pilot. And there were three officers on the ship who were white men who were officers in the Confederate Navy. One of them was this guy named Captain Riley, and he had two white mates who were also his crew. And in addition to them and Smalls, there were seven other enslaved men on the crew for a total of 11 people during normal sailing operations. It feels like a lot of guns for 11 dudes. <laughs> it's a lot of guns, but the expectation was basically in a fight. Anybody who was not actively engaged in steering the ship or keeping it running was going to be manning a gun. Yeah. So on May 12th, 1862, the CSS planter returned to Charleston at the end of a supply run and was restocked with ammunition, arms and supplies for those military outposts out on the sea islands. And as usual, it was docked outside the headquarters of a Confederate general. So it's like there's the dock. There's mm -hmm. the building next to the dock and the Confederate general's offices and staff are in that building. Captain Riley and his mates went ashore for the night. And some accounts say that they went to party. Some say that they went to see their families, whatever. I don't really know. The accounts differ pretty wildly. Technically, they were not supposed to leave the ship with the crew on it. But apparently that had become their habit. And so they told the enslaved men on the crew to remain on board overnight while they went ashore. But as part of this habit... They also told them, your families can come and visit you as long as they leave by curfew. So once the white crew went ashore and their families were aboard, then Smalls told the rest of the crew and their families that he wanted them to help him take the CSS planter, sail it out of Charleston Harbor, away from Confederate waters, and turn themselves over to the U.S. Navy. Yeah, that's what I would do. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, wait, my family can be here and I have stuff to barter with. I yeah. can be like, hey, we give up. Look, and I'll give you all this stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. So Robert also told them that there was no turning back once they left Doc. That he no, did not know <laughs> there would be no surrendering to the Confederacy. There would be no giving up the ship. He made it really clear to them. We have a whole bunch of guns. We have a whole bunch of ammunition. We will use these guns and this ammunition to shoot our way out of here if we have to. And if they are going to take us, we will sink the ship and we'll all die. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to be OK. Like we're making the choice right now. This is our last day as enslaved people, no matter what happens. A bunch of the crew did not know that he had planned that for this evening. So there was a lot of debate internally about like how dangerous is this yeah you kind of got to hold that close you don't you don't really yeah. leak that ahead of time yeah and their families had absolutely no idea that they were being asked to right then leave mm -hmm. two of the seven other members of the crew said nope this is too dangerous we can't do it and they left and went ashore mm -hmm. their families also declined to participate and they all went back ashore also but the other five crew and robert smalls and their families said yes we are on board we're doing this we're gonna go with this plan let's do it right now we are on board literally and figured <laughs> exactly so at 2 a.m on the 13th the remaining crew with robert as their new captain started preparing the ship to sail which this was a steamer that's not exactly a fast process you know so there was this like really tense period of time where the ship would clearly be preparing to leave at a time mm -hmm. when it was not supposed to be leaving right and they also returned their families to shore so that the confederates would see their families leave at curfew mm -hmm. and then once the boiler was up he ordered the remaining crew to hoist the flags of south carolina and the confederacy and they sailed away from the dock I'm just, I'm just imagining so i'm picturing like you know a port or a harbor and the three officers have gone into town and they're you know like getting their dinner or whatever at the bar that or restaurant that they can see like huh it's the boat moving no no no, no. It's just, <laughs> guys are playing tricks i know it's the sunset the way the sun is setting and the waves and then no it's fine it's not moving Wait, no I, i'm pretty sure that's moving the flags just went up. <laughs> I think that's probably part of why it happened at two in the morning. <laughs> right. But you're not wrong. <laughs> right. just, there were a lot of just... people who noticed this happening and noticed that it was unusual. Okay. There were some very, how should I phrase it, strenuously written letters that went around after all this. <laughs> <laughs> it's Robert's... a ghost ship. It's driving itself. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah call the confederate scooby-doo gang there's not supposed to be anybody on there how's it doing it <laughs> indeed by total coincidence smalls was the same build and the same height as captain riley and in fact he looked so much like him in stature that people used to joke that he could take his place on deck if he ever needed to there you go it's so funny to me so robert smalls 
put on the captain's wide-brimmed straw hat, and he put on the captain's Confederate Navy uniform, and he took up the captain's position on the deck of the ship, and he crossed his arms and folded his hands up under his armpits Uh so that nobody would see his skin if he kept his head down. And it was dark. Mm Mm-hmm. And he, having been the pilot of the ship for years, including a year of service on the ship while he was in the Confederate Navy and sailed in and out of the Charleston Harbor all the time, he knew all the coded whistle signals to give to any challenge that they might get from anybody else in the Confederate Mm -hmm. military. And so they just went sailing literally through every Confederate checkpoint on their way out of the harbor, including getting stopped and challenged to return the correct coded signal at Fort Sumter. How have they not made a movie of this? They're making a movie now. Oh, well, there you go. The ship stopped on its way out of the harbor before it had left. They stopped at the West Atlantic Wharf at 325, and they picked up all those families that they had just made a big show of escorting off the ship at curfew. Mm -hmm. Got them all back on the ship and started out for open water. And that meant that they were able to pick up Hannah, their children, and eight other enslaved people and get them all aboard and set sail. And they had to, like I said, they had to sail away from the headquarters of a Confederate general. They also had to pass two different Confederate forts, including Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter at the time was the most heavily armed fort in the Mm -hmm. region. And it was the one that people considered to be staffed by the most suspicious soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so when they sailed past Fort Sumter, they saw a challenge sent, you know, signaled to them. Mm -hmm. And they answered with the correct whistle response, the coded whistle response. It kind of like Morse code, you know, where there's like, you know, yeah. they, they had to give a series of basically dots and dashes as a mm-hmm. coded response. And there was apparently a long period of time while somebody at Fort Sumter debated whether or not it was okay. And then they got the all clear signal and they just like kept sailing. And his crew tried to convince him to sail away from Fort Sumter, like go the long way around it. Yeah. Smalls told him, no, if we do that, they're going to know something weird is happening. We just have to act like this is any regular run. Yep. Yeah. Act like you belong. Not making yeah. an equivalency, but act like you belong will get you into places. I have a buddy that he said that he could get into any concert with a towel. <laughs> Put a towel around your neck and just walk in the back door. Act like you're in one of the bands. <laughs> oh, you got to love a little social engineering. <laughs> so absolutely nobody in the Confederate Navy realized that anything was amiss until right after the CSS planter moved beyond the range of the Confederate guns. Mm-hmm. Because at that moment, because he was the pilot, he knew how far out that was. Mm-hmm. Smalls ordered the ship turned and they just like made full speed directly for the Union blockade. Like they were not mm-hmm. going to waste any time. Once they knew there was nobody who could shoot at them, they were out of there. On their way out there, he ordered the the crew lower those South Carolina and Confederate flags and run up a white bedsheet that his wife had taken from the hotel where she worked. Nice. As a flag of surrender. Yep. The U.S. Navy ship that they were headed towards was the USS Onward. And there, an officer of the U.S. Navy named Lieutenant Nichols ordered his sailors to fire on the heavily armed Confederate ship heading directly towards them. Sure. But Smalls had timed his journey so that the sun would be coming up as he approached them. And from an eyewitness account written at the time, here's the following quote. Just as number three port gun was being elevated, someone cried out, I see something that looks like a white flag. And true enough, there was something flying on the steamer that would have been white by application of soap and water. As she neared us, we looked in vain for the face of a white man. When they discovered that we would not fire on them, there was a rush of contrabands. And that's a term that I'm going to talk about in a minute. There was a rush of contrabands out on her deck. Some dancing, some singing, whistling, jumping, and others stood looking toward Fort Sumter and muttering all sorts of maledictions against it and the heart of the South generally. (laughs) I can only imagine what was being said. As the steamer came to this is still from that quote, uh, as the steamer came near and under the stern of the onward, one of the colored men stepped forward and taking off his hat, shouted, good morning, sir. I have brought you some of the old United States guns, sir. That man is Robert Smalls, and he and his family and the entire slave crew of the planter are now free. So why did he call them contrabands? We all know the term contraband as a reference to like smuggled goods. Right. And it already had that usage at the time of the Civil War. But during the Civil War, it came to be used by the U.S. military in a very specific way. 
Fort Monroe in Hampton Roads, Virginia, was this U.S. Army fort. And one of its claims to fame through the Civil War was that it was like right next to Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. Mm-hmm. But it never fell to the Union. It remained in Union hands the entire time. It was across a harbor from a Confederate fort that was built specifically to attack and take Fort Monroe. It never managed to be taken, though. And almost immediately after the start of the Civil War, like May of 1861, three enslaved men named Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend, who had been forced to help build that fort, sailed across the harbor under cover of darkness to Fort Monroe and turned themselves over to the U.S. Army in hopes of being freed. And the commander of Fort Monroe was this guy named Major General Benjamin Butler. He granted their request and refused to return them to the Confederate Army, who requested them back. As of 1850, with the Fugitive Slave Act, people who had enslaved persons could request that those persons be returned to enslavement with them if they escaped or were otherwise relocated away from their enslavers. And that included enslaved people who wound up in custody of the U.S. federal government via whatever means. So at the time of Baker's and Mallory's and Townsend's escape, technically the law said that the U.S. Army should hand them back over. But Major General Butler had been an attorney before he became a military officer. And he said, well, Virginia says it isn't part of the United States anymore. Right. I'm like, how does that rule still apply? (laughs) Right. So the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 doesn't apply to it or its citizens anymore. And thus, we at Fort Monroe are under no obligation to return former slaves. Mm -hmm. And that actually really bothered Lincoln because he realized that Butler's legal argument rested on Virginia no longer being part of the United States. And Mm -hmm. Lincoln was trying to prosecute a war on the basis that it was impossible for them to leave it. Oh, yeah. And so he was worried that this was like set a legal precedent that the Confederacy could later use to its advantage in some way. What a funny, I mean, I get it. I get it like from the legal thing, but what a, an interesting thing to be hung up on. Yeah, right. That's just the most administrative response I've, I, you could ever imagine. <laughs> it that. really is. Like if you've ever worked in a bureaucracy where people have to like worry a lot about following specific regulations, right. you hear this kind of thing and it's so believable. The U.S. Army and very shortly, like immediately afterwards, the U.S. Navy, regardless of Lincoln's concerns, adopted formal policies in which they declared that enslaved people who turned themselves over to the U.S. military could be declared contraband. They would be goods, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. that had been claimed during war. They would pay them a salary of ten dollars a month and they would provide food and living quarters if they would work for the federal government, often doing exactly the same sort of work. Those guys ended up, as far as I know, being asked to basically keep doing construction work on Fort Monroe. But now they were not considered enslaved anymore, and now they were getting paid to do that work, as well as being provided with room and board. The U.S. Congress moved really fast (laughs) to provide legal backing for this decision. For the first time ever, the U.S. Congress (laughs) moved very fast. (laughs) They passed legislation granting formal freedom to formerly enslaved people who turned themselves over to the U.S. military and explicitly barred any organ of the federal government from returning any persons to enslavement in the South. I mean, and that legislation like flew through Congress and got Lincoln's signature in a matter of weeks or days. And by then, though, the term contraband to refer to enslaved people who were now no longer enslaved because they had turned themselves over to the U.S. military, it really stuck. Like that Mm -hmm. was now the word that was going to get used. And so that's why that eyewitness account referred to them as contrabands. It's interesting. It's worth noting, however, that contraband status wasn't exactly freedom. Sure. Yeah, no, it doesn't sound exactly. I mean, there's a lot of strings. That's not freedom. Yeah. (laughs) But a lot of enslaved people saw it as way better than remaining slaves in the South. And so over the course of the war, 10,000 enslaved people got freedom by turning themselves over to the U.S. military and declaring themselves contraband. Hmm. I thought that was really interesting. And that policy remained in place throughout the rest, well, until the Emancipation Proclamation. Interesting. Yeah, Yeah. I'd never even heard of that. Yeah, neither had I. I was really like, I read that word in the account and was like, okay, I need to find out what's going on there. (laughs) So what about Robert Smalls and his family after they succeeded in stealing the most heavily armed guard ship in the Charleston Harbor? Real hunt for the Red October situation. (laughs) Right? Yeah, I mean, it really is. (laughs) Lieutenant Nichols boarded the planter. He raised the U.S. flag and he turned the ship and its crew over to his chain of command, Mm -hmm. along with a letter praising Smalls and his crew for their bravery and their cunning and pointing out, also, they brought us back a gun from Fort Sumter, which has a ton of symbolic value. It's a morale boost. 
Oh, yeah, huge. And that got forwarded along to his flag officer, this guy named Admiral DuPont, who was from the family that had founded the DuPont Corporation. And I pointed really? out, yeah, I pointed out simply to say, like, history is always right at hand. <laughs> so my ancestors will own the state of Delaware and poison <laughs> its ground. I mean, uh, <laughs> and maybe a chunk of Transylvania County, North Carolina also. Yeah. DuPont sent the Navy secretary the captured flags from the planter and another letter praising Smalls and his crew and saying, these people have committed an extraordinary act and they deserve recognition. And then while he waited to hear what the U.S. Navy would say about it, he and his staff personally took care of Robert Smalls, his family and everybody else from the crew. Sure. In part because something else they had brought them, in addition to the flags and the guns, was a Confederate code book for all those whistle signals. Ooh, nice. Yes. He also had information about the Confederate Army positions. He was able to tell them that the Confederacy had had to withdraw a lot of its troops from Charleston and send them to Tennessee and Virginia to fight battles there. And that that meant there were actually only a few thousand soldiers in the entire Charleston region. And they had abandoned a bunch of those fortifications out on the sea islands that he was the pilot for the ship right. that took their supplies. He was able to tell them troop positions, patrols, the times of patrols, the code book for Charleston Harbor, and... At one point, the planter had been used to lay mines in Charleston Harbor and around it. And he was mm -hmm. able to tell them where all those mines were also. So he has this one. massive font of intelligence to benefit mm -hmm. the U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that intelligence, they were able to start retaking Confederate military positions on the islands around Charleston a week later and held those sea islands as a base of operations for the rest of the war. We did. Gosh, was it? I can't remember if it was a Patreon thing or not. The Folly Island treasure, which has ties to the Civil War. Oh, I don't remember now either. But it was like an island was about to get taken. One of the mm -hmm. sea islands was about to get taken. So like treasure got buried. Anyway, I just the connective tissue here yeah. is, is crazy. Yeah. So within a week, the U.S. Navy is acting on this intelligence and retaking positions that they held for literally years. Mm -hmm. Two and a half weeks later, May 30th of 1862, the U.S. Congress passed what's called a private bill. And that means it gets used to sort of grant special requests or provide some sort of special legal relief to an individual or maybe a corporation, specifically when whatever their circumstance is can't be dealt with under existing regulations or existing law. Mm -hmm. But everybody kind of recognizes that like something needs to happen. And this private bill commended Smalls and it authorized the Navy to appraise the planter and then pay Smalls half of that appraised value as compensation for, quote, rescuing her from the enemies of the government. Wow, that's got to be a lot of money. Yeah, the U.S. Navy gave Smalls 1500 bucks, and he, his family, his crew, and all of their passengers were all freed, and everybody got compensated and taken care of. Harper's Weekly picked up this story and started running illustrations of Planter and portraits of Smalls, and he was instantly this massive rock star of the Union. Sure. Everybody knew in the South that this had happened immediately. Uh, and it was yeah. just like this massive source of humiliation for the Confederacy. As soon as it happened, officers in Charleston started to realize this will be a massive embarrassment for us. There was an officer in Charleston sending heated letters up the chain the same day that he made off with the ship saying, well, it's not my fault that nobody stopped him because the planter was the guard ship and we had been ordered to let it come and go without interference because we didn't get to know why it was coming and going. We just let it go. And that's because you told us to, <laughs> despite the fact that it was repeatedly challenged on its way out to sea. They just didn't want to admit that he knew how to give all the right responses and, and disguise himself. That's also an intelligence move, too, though, right? Because like you don't want to admit that, you know, the code book is gone. Oh, yeah, totally. It's an older code, sir, but it checks out <laughs> it's <not> from Star Wars. <laughs> right. Confederate officers also made up a story that two white men and a white woman had boarded the ship shortly before Smalls and his crew left dock because they found it too scandalous to admit that an entirely enslaved black crew had succeeded at this. They had to make <laughs> up some white people and inject them into the story. In that's order some, to try to protect themselves. That's some next level copium. <laughs> it was really, really funny to read about just like the response that happened within the Confederate military. Captain Riley and his two mates were they they were both court martialed and they were they were all three of them were court martialed and they were found guilty, but their convictions were later overturned. Immediately after his escape and recognition by the military and Congress. 
President Lincoln invited Smalls to the White House and met with him. And that's another fun little tie-in with the ghost town of Goshen Hill. Every time mm-hmm. anything happens in the Civil War that was outstanding or heroic, we hear Lincoln invited them to the White House so that he could meet with them. It's just like <laughs> such, a, such a different time. People were so much more available. Yeah, they were a little too available. Fast forward yeah. to the yeah. theater. <laughs> <laughs> so at that meeting, Smalls personally lobbied Lincoln and the Secretary of War this guy named Stanton, to start admitting black soldiers into the army. And Lincoln ordered it a few months later. And then Smalls went on a speaking tour to sold out houses throughout the Union and personally recruited approximately 5,000 black soldiers into the U.S. Army. It's like a black Captain America before we had a black Captain America. Yeah. And then in fewer than six months after that, by October of 1862, Smalls had joined the U.S. Navy and was piloting the USS Planter as part of Admiral DuPont's blockade of Charleston. That rules. That must have felt so good. He also piloted a few other ships at first. There was a specific commander that really liked working with him. And as that commander got shuffled around between ships, he would always make sure that Smalls got transferred with him. But eventually, Smalls wound up back as the pilot of the planter again with a different captain that he had not worked with before. Smalls participated in 17 naval battles, including attacking Fort Sumter. <laughs> and... Two months after that, a pitched naval battle at Folly Island Creek, your Folly Island connection, Mm -hmm. where he had to assume command from that new captain because the shooting got pretty hot, as it was described in one account. And the captain went and hid in the coal bin. This U.S. Navy captain who had been a captain in the U.S. Navy for a long time got scared and went and hid in the coal bin because he was afraid that they were all going to get shot out on deck. And Smalls took command and managed to pilot the ship away from the fight to safety and keep it afloat and prevent it from sinking because he was worried that if they let the ship be taken or if it sank and they swam away from it, that the Confederacy would kill them on sight. Oh, they absolutely would. The Confederacy had put a $4,000 reward out for his murder personally and he knew yeah in response to that the navy removed the old captain promoted smalls to the rank of captain and put him in command of the uss planter for the rest of the war and i love it he got paid 150 bucks a month to be the captain of the ship that he stole from the confederacy pretty awesome yeah there are people if you read different accounts of this online who like say well technically he was never an officer i think we all know why they say that When the war ended in 1865, Smalls was still commanding the USS Planter, and he was part of the victory ceremonies in Charleston Harbor. He and his crew provided passage for African Americans in Charleston to attend the re-raising of the U.S. flag at Fort Sumter, for which he also was present as part of the ceremony. Man, that's a wild, wild run. He wasn't done. (laughs) Go on. Like a lot of families, the McKee family had lost a lot by the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. The plantation owner who had originally been the slaveholder for him and his mother. Right. At the end of the war, the federal government basically said to a lot of people who had refused to pay taxes because Mm -hmm. they were in the South and they were back in the Confederacy. Well, you never paid your back taxes, so we're seizing your property. And that's what happened to the McKees. The house Robert Smalls had grown up in got seized by the federal government Mm -hmm. and put up for sale. And so Smalls used a thousand of that 1500 bucks that he got paid for the ship and bought the house and (laughs) lived in it for the rest of his life. That's awesome. I think that's so cool. He and his wife moved his mother in. So his Mm -hmm. mother came to live with him also. And after he bought the house, McKee tried to sue him and say that it was not valid that his property had been seized by the federal government. And that case went up through the courts all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm sure a lot of people filed that kind of suit. Yeah. In 1875, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Robert Smalls's favor in the case. They established a precedent by doing yeah. so that all those seizures were valid. And so like a whole lot of people got to hang on to stuff that they bought at the end of the war. It was really interesting to read that part of the history. It really validated the federal government saying, no, you don't get to decide you're in the country and out of the country and in the country and whatever. Right. <laughs> we, we still see a little bit of that today. With Yeah, we do. Like, I'm going to join ISIS. Can I come back now? It kind of sucks. No. <laughs> no. You get to stay over there. You can come back. We'll try you. But <laughs> have fun with that. Mm-hmm. But by the time that that was all settled, McKee's wife was a widow and she was very elderly. Mm-hmm. And Robert Smalls and his family invited her to come live in the house again with them. And they cared for her for the rest of her life also. That's that's nice. He cared for her as well as he did his own mother. And I think that's really, really wild. He is much more generous of spirit than I might have been. 
Then he became a politician. He served a term in the South Carolina State House from 1868 to 1870 as the representative from Beaufort County. He served in the South Carolina State Senate from 1870 to early 1875. He left the state Senate in 1875 because that was when he took office as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. And there he served five terms in the U.S. House. After his terms in Congress, he was twice appointed to be the collector of customs for the port of Beaufort, which meant that he oversaw all customs enforcement and what we would today refer to as border security. Again, the irony just astounds me. I love it. Yeah. So the movie that they're making, is it specifically about the escape or is it about his entire life? No idea. Absolutely no idea. All I know is that Amazon has apparently begun a project and hired a screenwriter and a director, and they say that they have something in development to tell this story. Because I feel like it could go either way, right? Like you could make like a Hunt for Red October hyper-focused on the incident, or you mm-hmm. could do like a full biographical film and it would still be very compelling. Yeah. And then he served in that role until 1913 and during that time remained an outspoken critic of Jim Crow laws and the revised state constitutions that had stripped many or all Black people of their political rights across the South, including in both North Carolina and South Carolina. Throughout his career, he's credited with working to improve conditions for all South Carolinians and all the people in his congressional district. For instance, he's the person who saw to it that public education became available and compulsory throughout the state for both white and black kids. And he worked to pass a civil rights act in the South Carolina state legislature in 1869. So you said there was the traveling exhibit. Mm -hmm. You might be getting to this, but are there any monuments in South Carolina? He died in 1915. Okay. And... His gravesite in the cemetery of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Beaufort has a statue in his honor and a plaque with some quotes from him. He also was inducted in 2010 into the South Carolina Hall of Fame. So there's like a permanent exhibit for him. His home, the one that he bought, the Robert Smalls house, is at 511 Prince Street in Beaufort. That's now a national heritage site. There you go. There was the traveling exhibition that some of his descendants put on. One of his great-great-grandsons has done a series of TED Talks talking about his story and has done like other public speaking to talk about Mm. this. There is a book that one of his descendants wrote about his story. And uh, yeah, there has been a lot of effort on the part specifically of his descendants to try to remind people of this story. His family lived in that house, like his descendants lived in that house Mm -hmm. until the mid-1950s. And his youngest child lived until 1970. Wow. That's how close history like this is. I always am shocked when I read something like that. I always think it's so long ago. It's so far away. It is many generations in the past. But I almost overlapped in my own life, time-wise, with somebody who was his child. Probably going to get the relation wrong, so I'll just say a person. But I remember my dad saying, when I was a kid, I remember asking, like, oh, Civil War, so long ago. He was like, when he was a child, so when my father was a child, he was like, no, there was old guys around that remembered it. Mm -hmm. There was a family event, I don't know, 10 or so years ago, maybe 15, where one of my great uncles was turning like 92 and he was telling mm-hmm. stories at this event. It had, in some ways had been organized as a way for him to tell stories. Mm-hmm. And some of the stories he was telling were about people who were civil war veterans who mm-hmm. he grew up knowing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, he knew people who had experienced it as adults. Yeah. See, I think the reference that I have, it's not quite that direct. It's more like some really old person that remembered it or something. I mean, oh, I, could sure, be wrong yeah. on that. I, I don't want to get it wrong, but that is, it's wild. History is always much closer than we think. Right. That's the story of Robert Smalls, who stole his ship and became its captain. Yeah, it's not an awesome story. You, you can cut this if you want. Um, but talking about how history is closer than you think, I will always remember the Holocaust survivor that came and talked to us in elementary school. It was this little old woman that came in. And I mean, we were young. It must have been like third or fourth grade. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously the talk was appropriate to that age group. Sure. But she was there and she came and she talked to us and I'll never forget what she said. And it was rock the boat. (laughs) That was what (laughs) all of a sudden she had a thick accent that I'm not going to do, which is rare for me because I I do a lot of voices on this show, (laughs) but I'm not going to do that. But I remember she was, it was, and she was like, you know, if you see something wrong, rock the boat, Mm -hmm. like rock the boat. And that was her thing. Yeah. History is always very, very close, both in good and bad ways. And I think in the case of this story, it's in a fantastic way. I really like the story. I had never heard it before, had no idea who the person was, has definite ties to other stories that we've talked about. I really enjoy, we were talking the other day, you were like doing a lot of history ones. And I was just like, I don't care. They're really good. (laughs) I was like, I just don't want people to think that I don't care about monsters anymore. 
<laughs> I love monsters. I'm going to get to talk about some fun paranormal stuff coming up. But this spring, I'm definitely doing a couple of really history heavy episodes and I love it. I love it so much. Next month, I'm going to get to record with you an episode about somebody who is an even more outrageously daring character. And I'm working on one about killer mermaids, <laughs> which I love. I can't wait. I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> One of my writer friends, Shauna McGuire, has a series that's a horror series about killer mermaids. And I'm like, so excited. I can't wait. When it's done, I'm going to be like, hey, Shauna, you have to hear this. <laughs> But thank you for doing this one. I really like these sort of pure history ones, I guess you could say. Yeah. One of the things I like about them is there's no question. This is definitely <laughs> something real that happened that happened uniquely in the Carolinas. And it is hidden history in a lot of ways, like because despite the efforts to preserve the story, I had never heard it. Yeah. But now I'm like, well, if I'm ever in Beaufort, I am definitely going to go check out that house. Yeah. There are a couple of cool, like brief documentaries about him, like 10 minute long that South Carolina, mm -hmm. Public, South Carolina Public Television television produced and i'll link to those in the show notes also and i'll link to basically anything else that i've got that i think would be of public interest about like learning more hearing more about this story but you know you mentioned all the connective tissue to so many other shows we've done and i think that's one of the great things about doing a show constrained to the carolinas mm -hmm. the more of this stuff we talk about the more we see how interconnected it all is yeah so i love that i love this story i think robert smalls is this amazing hero i'm just like so glad that i happened to run across somebody talking about him online that's great well thank you very much leave us a voicemail if you want that phone number again Again, is hold on. I was not prepared for that. I just started <laughs> rambling. Nothing is scripted. I just was like, I'm going to talk about the voicemail. It's a uh, <laughs> leave us a voicemail at 919 444 2110. And thanks for listening. You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating, leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind the scenes info, pictures, videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our patreon our facebook our twitter our instagram all that in one place including the merch store buy a shirt clothe your body drape your body in our wares <laughs> be our living billboards Ma 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 